Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? Good. Well, welcome to everybody who's here in person in our audience and also to everyone joining us virtually. It's really nice to see your faces. Um, my name is Nora Sachs. I'm a producer here at WBUR and I help out with Circle Round. And we're so excited to have you back here for another Circle Round book party. Who is here for the first one? Oh my, oh my gosh, repeat customer is awesome. Um, well, as you might know, Circle Round series of picture and activity books are created in partnership with Story Publishing. And today we're here celebrating the debut of the third Circle Round picture book. Anyone know the name? The Great Ball Game. Excellent. Which is based on one of my favorite episodes of the podcast. And your host and author, Rebecca Shear, is going to read The Great Ball Game aloud while composer Eric Shimalonis accompanies on the organ. And after the reading, there'll be a short Q&A. So listen closely. Think of some burning questions you want to ask them. And after the Q&A, be sure to pick up a copy of all the Circle Round books available via our partners at Porter Square Books. Rebecca and Eric will be signing books after the program. So if you've got your copy, hold on to it. They'd be happy to sign it. Um, also, you can join myself and my colleague Tina out in the lobby. Uh, to get all of your Circle Round merchandise, like this brand new adorable plush lion. Who's got one so far? Seeing some of the audience? Yes, great to cuddle with during story time. Um, also, we have some free coloring page uh, pages you can pick up, some crayons, some bookmarks. Also, the selfie station. Do not forget to stop by and get your selfie and share your pics with us on social media using the hashtag uh, Circle Round books. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let you know that we actually have a whole menu of shows made by WBUR podcasts, including Endless Thread, which is wild stories from the internet and beyond, Last Seen, which is all kinds of eclectic mysteries, and now, for those of you who live locally, a brand new daily podcast called The Common. So you can subscribe to all of them. There's something for everyone. Um, so we encourage you to listen to all of them, grown-ups and kids included. Uh, lastly, I just want to say a very big thank you to everyone who helped make this event possible, including our partners at Story Publishing, Porter Square Books, the team at BUR, and of course, your amazing hosts. Let's give a warm welcome to Rebecca Shear and Eric Shimalonis of Circle Round. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How are we today? Right on. I'm Rebecca Shear, and I am so excited to circle around with you today as we introduce the third circle around picture book, The Great Ball Game. Uh, the book features text by me and illustrations by Joshua Powis Steckley, an amazing Ojibwe woodland artist. Joining me on stage today is my partner in crime, life, podcasting, Eric Shimalonis. Let's hear it. Round of applause for Eric. As you may know, for every single Circle Round episode each season, Eric plays a different solo instrument. So if you were here to see us do the tale of the unwelcome guest, he played the oud. And for a taste of honey, he played the sitar. And for this one, he chose something rather fitting for a ball game. Eric, can we hear a little sample? So we couldn't bring a massive pipe organ with us today because they weigh something like seven elephants worth of, of weight. Um, but we do have our electronic organ, which you'll be hearing today as we read the great ball game. So let's get to it. Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in? Feeling like you're too different to be part of a group can be uncomfortable. But sometimes your greatest power lies in the things that set you apart and make you special. In fact, in this story, being different is the name of the game. Versions of this folktale have been told for centuries among many indigenous peoples in North America, including the Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, Ojibwe, and Menominee. So sit back, get cozy, and circle around for the great ball game. <laughs> Once upon a time, the animals and birds were arguing about which side was better. 
The birds were led by a lanky-legged, long-necked crane. You silly animals! Our wings allow us to soar and swoop up to the clouds. Clearly, we birds are superior to you awkward, earthbound beasts. The animals were led by burly, bulky bear. Not so fast, crane. We awkward, earthbound beasts can run, swim, and slither. Plus, we have teeth. Obviously, we are far more exceptional than you flighty bird brains. The bickering went on and on. Then one day, the two sides actually found something they agreed on, a way to end the squabbling once and for all. We will hold a ball game. Yes, and whoever's team scores the first goal wins the debate. So, early one morning, all the creatures faced off on a spacious grassy field flanked by two goals. On one side of the field were the birds. There was Crane, along with Hawk and Eagle, Owl and Duck, Turkey and Crow, Raven and Sparrow, plus all the other birds who soared and swooped through the air. On the other side of the field were the animals. Led by Bear, there was Deer and Fox, Rabbit and Skunk, Turtle and Frog, Lizard and Snake, plus all the other animals who ran, swam, and slithered on the earth. But, just as the game was about to begin, an unfamiliar voice pierced the air. Hey guys, what about me? <laughs> Halfway between the two teams stood a tiny creature nobody had ever seen before. The pint-sized fellow was no larger than a field mouse or a chickadee. He didn't seem to be an animal or a bird. Although he was furry, with huge oval ears, he also had wings. But his wings weren't covered with feathers, they were covered with skin. Can you guess what the tiny critter's name was? Yeah. Bat! So, guys, which side should I be on? Bear scratched his shaggy head. Well, little one, clearly you have wings, so you can't be on our side. Crane blinked her beady orange eyes. But look at him! He has fur and teeth, so he certainly can't be on our side. Once again, the birds and animals actually agreed on something. Neither side wanted Bat to join its team. But Bat refused to give up. Listen, I'll give you three good reasons why you should pick me to join your side. Reason number one, my hearing. My ears can pick up just about anything. In fact, Bear, right now, I can hear the sound of honey dripping off your front paw. Oh, I guess I missed that from breakfast. Reason number two, my wings. Tell me, Crane, how fast can you fly? Well, on a good day, I can fly 35 miles an hour. Not bad. On a good day, I can clock in at nearly 100 miles an hour. Not only that, but reason number three, I can eat bugs like nobody's business. Especially at night. That's when I really shine. Bat paused. He took a deep breath. So, I ask you all again. Which side should I be on? Bear and Crane exchanged an uneasy look. Well, I don't know what to say, Bat. You're just not like us animals. And you're not like us birds, either. You're... Different. You don't belong. Bat frowned and tucked in his wings and hung his fuzzy head. All right, I get it. Enjoy your game. And with that, he slumped off the field and disappeared into the forest. Moments later, the game began. 
Right from the start, both teams played hard. On the animal side, the first one to grab hold of the ball was deer. Aha! And got it! But as the graceful creature loped down the field toward the bird's goal, she got distracted. Raven had swooped down and started flipping and flapping all around Deer's head. Eek! Yikes! Oh! Ow! Frustrated, Deer hurled the ball toward Fox. But before Fox had a chance to catch it, Hawk zoomed over and stole it. Ha ha! Oh no! Hawk passed the ball to Eagle, who began diving toward the animal's goal. Make way, Eagle coming through! But as Eagle glided downward, who should hop up and tear the ball from the bird's talons but Rabbit? Hee hee hee! Drat! This kind of thing went on all day. Just when it seemed like one team was about to score, the other side would make a surprise move and intercept the ball. Before long, the sun was setting, and the animals and birds were exhausted. But both teams kept playing, or trying to anyway. Once the sun sank below the horizon and it got dark, most of the creatures couldn't see a thing. Animals like bear and skunk had excellent night vision, as did birds like owl, but everyone else stumbled about. To make matters worse, as the inky sky drained of light, the warm air filled with bugs, but not just any bugs, mosquitoes. Yow! Oh! Ah! Oh! The pesky insects weren't playing on either team, but they drove both sides bonkers as they buzzed, hummed, and bit. Despite the growing chaos, Bear managed to seize the ball and lumber toward the bird's goal. It seemed like he might actually score and win the game for the animals. But then, the biggest mosquito you ever did see landed right on Bear's nose and bit down hard. As Bear patted his throbbing snout, the ball went flying from his paws. It sailed up, 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 past the animals, past the birds. It whizzed up over the treetops and disappeared. The two teams fell silent. Without a ball, how could they play the game? And without playing the game, how could they decide once and for all which side was better? Nobody knew what to do. Everyone just stared at the treetops. Then suddenly, something appeared in the sky. It was a tiny creature darting this way and that before hovering right above everyone's heads. The creature was furry with wings and was no larger than a field mouse or a chickadee and clutched tightly in his little claws was the ball. And do you know who it was? <laughs> you guessed it, Bat. Hey guys, looking for something? <gasps> Bear and Crane were stunned. But Bat, it's buggy. It's dark. How'd you find the ball? And so quickly. As Bear and Crane gaped in amazement, Bat explained, it's like I told you, I had three good reasons why you should pick me to join your side. First, my ears are so excellent, I could hear exactly where the ball landed. Second, my flying is so good, I could pick up that ball and bring it back in no time. And what about the bugs? Bat smiled, stuck out his long pink tongue, then zipped around the field. Before the animals and birds knew it, every single mosquito was gone. It's like I said, I can devour bugs like nobody's business, especially at night. Bat licked his lips and lowered himself down to the grass. So, Bear, Crane, you're right. I am different. But you know what? So are all of you. Bat extended a stretchy wing toward the birds. Crane, look at the differences among your team alone. Owl flies and hunts at night. Turkey waddles and gobbles during the day. And hummingbird is so tiny, she's smaller than I am. You do have a point. Bat gestured toward the animals. Bear, take a look at your team. Frog, ribbits and hops. Snake slithers and hisses, and turtle spends most of her time inside her shell. 
That's true, isn't it? Bat flashed everyone a grin. Friends, we're all different. And different can be good. Different can be great. If we were all the same, think what a boring world this would be. The animals and birds all looked at Bat. Then they all looked at each other. Then they closed their eyes. Together they tried picturing a place where everybody was the same. Where everyone just had fur or scales or feathers. Where everyone just walked or swam or flew. Where everyone made the same sounds, ate the same foods, did the same things. And thanks to furry flying bat, both the animals and birds found yet another thing they agreed on. Nobody wanted to live in a world like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was our first time reading this book out loud in front of a crowd, and what a crowd you are. Thank you so, so much. Now, though, we would love to hear from you if you have any questions about Circle Round, about the stories, about the books, about what it is that Eric and I do. Um, we have microphones that are going to be in the audience, Amy and Steven. Uh, we'll be calling on people. You'll ask your question into the mic because hello to our folks watching wherever you are. We are thrilled to have you. And uh, let's hear from our audience. How about right here, rainbows? Rainbows and sunshine on the shirt? Dress. Thank you. I like Ella and the Dragon, so. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yes, right behind is fine. What type of game were they playing? That is such a wonderful question. You noticed in the pictures, what were they holding in their hands? They were holding sticks. Have you ever seen a sport that has a stick like that? Lacrosse. It looks a lot like lacrosse. Well, our artist Joshua, he's an Ojibwe woodland artist, and in his tradition there's a game called stick ball, which is very much like lacrosse. It dates way, way back in his part of the country, and yes, you've got the stick with the little net at the top and you're throwing the ball across trying to get the goal. Good question, good eye. Um, how about right here in the front row with the greenish turquoise mask? Um, how do you think of good ideas? <laughs> First of all, thank you for saying that they're good. Sometimes when you're a writer, you're not sure if any good ideas are happening as you're typing the words. Um, I owe it all to the source material. Luckily, we have these folk tales from all over the world that go back generation after generation after generation. And I'm constantly at a magical, mystical place called the library, reading folktale books and trying to find wonderful stories that we can adapt into the audio plays that we do for modern audiences. Um, how about another rainbow right there? How do you, how do you find the folk tales that you tell? A lot of it is those books at the library. I am just constantly looking for picture books like the great ball game that someone might have done, but also collections or anthologies as they're called in the grown up library world. We also get suggestions from listeners, which I absolutely love. We did a story called the basilisks stare. Did I get that name right? Yes, basilisks, I was asking my son because he's listened to every episode 65 times. Um, a listener who grew up in Poland remembered their grandmother telling them that story and um, they sent us a Polish version that they then translated into English for us and it led to that episode. So we find our stories in all sorts of surprising places. How about right back there on the aisle? How many episodes do you have? Eric Shimalonis, how many? If we count the shorties that we did during the early days of COVID, we did a couple like extra short bonus episodes. Eric says we have 192, and I believe him. Whoa. That's a, that many? Wow, time flies. 
Um, no, but it's so many people. How about right here in the second from the front? We haven't done this side of the room. Um, why did the teams were grumpy? Why did the teams? Why were the teams grumpy? <laughs> why are the teams grumpy? Well, have you ever been in a disagreement with someone? Have you ever been fighting about something? Rarely are you in a good mood when you're fighting. And I think the animals and birds, this quarrel they've had about which side is better, it goes back quite a ways until Bat finds a way to help them see common ground. How about, yeah, right there? Yeah. Uh, why'd you decide to do birds versus um, animals? I'm why birds versus animals? In the source material, in the original stories told among all these indigenous peoples of North America, it was the birds and the animals trying to duke it out. So we, we, there are certain things we change when we adapt our folk tales, little modifications that we make, but we stayed very true to that source story. Um, right there, with the glittery, shiny, fabulous, yes. Um, um, why is there reptiles? <laughs> so in this case, we sort of generalized that animals would include reptiles. Because they're more like animals than like birds, right? Although if you go back with the dinosaurs and maybe chickens are descended from, but this is a folk tales podcast, not science, so. <laughs> um, here in the front row. I really like how many different voices you use. <laughs> Thank you. Now, when you're listening to Circle Round, the podcast, I don't do all the voices. Uh, we have many, many actors across the country, and of course, our celebrity guest or two each week. Um, I occasionally do a little tiny voice somewhere, but I'm not accustomed to doing all the voices, so that means a lot to me. Thank you. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> this side of the room, I feel like I've been ignoring you. Circle Round t-shirt, right there. Why don't you... Why don't you, like, have all the books on your podcast? You mean all 192 episodes as books? That would be amazing. Talk to my publisher. They're called Story Publishing. Um, <laughs> well, this is the third in the series. There will be a fourth. It's coming out in May. It's based on an episode called The Lion's Whisker. So be on the listen for that. And then beyond that, if there are more, you'll be the first to know. How about right here in the blue, waiting so patiently? Um, how, who started this whole um, program? Who started Circle Round? WBUR, Boston's NPR news station, <laughs> approached me and Eric about doing a children's podcast. And no one was sure what that meant. Would it be a science show? Would it be history? What would it be? And we worked together to decide to do folk tales as audio plays um, from around the world. And now we're in our sixth season. And it's just been, it's been a joy. <laughs> uh, right there on the end in that section. What was the very first one? The very first Circle Round episode? Yeah. We call that our pilot episode. This is the one that we made for BUR to see if they liked it. <laughs> Luckily they did. It was called It Could Always Get Worse. It was adapted from a Yiddish folktale, and we got an actor named Jason Alexander to play the lead. Most people know him from Seinfeld. He played George Costanza. He plays the man in that story. Um, how about back there? I saw, the, I saw they were playing tennis. Oh, okay. Well, they are holding something that looks a lot like a racket, right? You could, yeah, you could easily think that. And all we say is the great ball game. We never say what kind of game it is. So you can easily use your imagination to pick any kind of game you want. Um, how about here in the second row? Um, what is your um, favorite restaurant? <laughs> My favorite restaurant? Well, if I have to be absolutely honest, I don't have one because my husband, Eric Shimalonis, is such an amazing cook. 
that I get to go to my favorite restaurant every day. <laughs> How about here in the front row? Where did you get this story from? I'm trying to remember where I first found this story. I found a version of it in a book of folk tales by indigenous peoples from North America, from Canada and the United States. But I'm, I never stop there. If I find one version of a story, I don't stop there. I try to find as many versions as I can, written by as many people. So I think in the end, um, I save a copy of everything. I think I have like 13 versions of this story. And then what I do is I put them all in front of me, and I find a way to turn them into the circle round story that you get to hear on the podcast. How about right there in the back row by the sound mixing booth? How do you choose like one of the stories that you find? That's a great question. How do I choose? Because I come across, the, yeah, how do I choose? That's a, that's a tough question. A lot of the time, I will mention to Eric a story that I found and sort of give him the summary and say, well, what do you think? Because I'm thinking it's not going to work. But then he'll think, but wait, if you just change this one part, maybe it could work. Or you're right, let's try to find something else. Or for instance, I'm trying to think of an episode where this happened recently. The Golden Advice is an episode we did recently with Kate Siegel, where there's the parrot scout. What does he say, Eric? What, or Igor, what's his line? Struggle so much, struggle so much. Rah! Yeah, so I didn't play the parrot. But um, I've been collecting versions of that story since Circle Round started. And I thought, eh, it's sort of missing something. How come this person keeps remembering the advice all on their own? I, I, eh. Three years later, I thought, what if we add a parrot? And that's her reminder with the advice. Um, so there are stories I think I'm not going to do, and then suddenly something gets unlocked, and it turns into the episode that you get to hear on the podcast. How about right there on the end? Right by Amy. Um, what's your favorite part of this job? Working with my husband, Eric Shimalonis. <laughs> Um, when, we, when we met, I was a reporter for NPR in Washington, D.C., and he was a composer and sound designer for movies and theater. And we joked that one day we would quit our jobs and start our own business and work together. And we thought, oh, ha, ha, that'll never happen. Who gets to do that? No one gets to live the dream like that. But we're living the dream. So, eight years later. <laughs> um, how about right there next to Stephen? Uh, um, how do you, oh. you forget? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you do such a fast voice in your podcast? Such a fast voice. I think it's because I used to work for NPR. <laughs> um, and they'd say, we want you to go out and do this story. It's so interesting. And um, when it's all done, you have 30 seconds on the air to tell it. So I learned <laughs> how to peck a lot in. So thank you, NPR. <laughs> um, there, right there, yeah. How does Eric Chimelonis compose in, compose in all in front of the people. Yeah. Playing in front of people is the hard part. Um, I get nerves still because I don't perform a whole lot, but composing for the podcast is a dream job for me because ever since I was your age, it was hard for me to commit to one instrument. I didn't want to play just one instrument, and I wanted to play all the ones that I could get my hands on. So for a lot of years, that felt like I was spread too thin, and maybe I was giving something up by playing all these instruments. And then this show came along. And now it completely justifies all those years and, and, <laughs> and the fear of commitment. And now I continue to buy cool instruments for this show and get to learn them. And it's part of the job. But it's a thrill for me to get to change instruments every single week and have to think in terms of a new sound and how that sound helps to tell the story. It's a really neat part of it for me, and I really enjoy introducing, hopefully, new instruments to all of you, instruments that you might not have heard otherwise that are from distant parts of the world or from another era. So keep listening for those, because there's a lot more interesting stuff to come. 
I think we have time for, let's say, two more questions. Um, how about here, second from the end in this row? Um, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, it's so interesting because with a lot of authors, they have to write from scratch. They start writing and there's nothing that already exists. We already had the podcast. So I was able to take the script and read through it and think, how can we turn this into a book? And a lot of that was Joshua Powestekli, our illustrator, working with him to decide what are we going to show versus what are we going to tell. So it took several months of going back and forth and back and forth um, over email. He's in Canada. Um, of him suggesting ideas of maybe ways that we could take away. Like, we couldn't decide if, if I should say Bat licked his lips or should he show him licking his lips. It's questions like that. Um, so it took a period of a few months, I would say. Lots of back and forths with me rewriting and Joshua redrawing. But it was a terrific process. One more question. Um, I don't know how to choose. <laughs> how about right there? Uh, when I was little, um, I uh, sucked my thumb, and so uh, my mom put um, like a jar, and it, every time, every night, I when I didn't um, suck my thumb, I'd put a marble in, and when it was full, I uh, I could get a um, wish that I wanted to do, and ever since, I wanted my dream was to go here and see you. <laughs> Wow, two things. One, thank you. And two, that's a great now it's your turn idea for one of our activities at the end of the podcast. Um, whenever the story ends on the show, I always come in and say, now it's your turn. And I introduce a craft or an activity or a game or a discussion prompt for you to do something to keep the story experience going. And I love that idea. That is brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and also, just to let you know, the books, all three Circle Round books, are filled with activities at the end. Not just one, but at least a dozen. So even when you're done reading the story, you can spend days, weeks, months still having fun and thinking about what you read. Um, I would love to meet everyone out in the lobby. There's a selfie station, there's cool Circle Round swag, we're going to be signing books. So I think I'll sign off now, as I always do. I'm Rebecca Shear. Thanks for circling around with us. <laughs>